Welcome Cogs, and welcome to the Cog Lab. About four months ago, I moved into a new apartment and finally had my own spare room to create a cutting edge robotics and animatronics workshop, so advanced that Skynet sent a guy back in time to try and stop me from finishing it. The only problem was I am a renter, which means that the spare room is only marginally bigger than my wardrobe, and I'm not allowed to touch the walls or make any noise. Add in the fact that compulsive hoarding runs in my family and I started to realise I had a bit of an uphill struggle. Since it's the festive season, I'm going to split this video into 25 tidbits, one for each day leading up to Christmas. We'll cover my modular storage system, setting up a print farm, my RGB LED lighting system, and sprinkling a few miscellaneous tips too. A tidbit can be a piece of information, a design, or a program, and everything I mention will be downloadable as a printable STL file for free on my project archive in the description. But if you want modifiable, downloadable, exportable CAD files for all of my projects, you can get that by subscribing to any tier on my Patreon page. So the first thing that became immediately apparent when I got started was that the floor and shelves placed on the floor weren't going to cut it for the mountains of stuff that I have. Tidbit number one is that if you don't have a lot of space, you need to turn your gears upwards. There's always more space on the walls. So for my storage system, I chose the multi-board. I admit that initially I was pretty impulsive about it. I mostly just liked the design of all the parts, to be honest. And so I started pumping out these grid tiles without a second thought. As I've used it more and more, I've grown to appreciate the functional and practical design decisions that have gone behind it too. I love that the same bin can be a shallow tray for screws, it can be a deep container for pens, it can be mounted sideways and turned into drawers, and it means that if you do decide to reconfigure the system, the parts can be reused in so many different ways. So there's tidbit number two. Multigrid is my chosen storage system, and it's really cool, however, it does have a big issue for renters in that it's primarily designed to be screwed into walls. They do have a command strip mounting system, but I didn't really trust that, plus it would have been pretty expensive. I noticed that the multi-board library had a vertical pole mounting solution with teeth designed to bite into a wooden dowel, and that gave me the idea to adapt the mounting system to work with, tidbit number three, vertical tension poles. If you've never seen them before, it's basically a telescopic pole that you screw or unscrew to the length you need, and it has some springs inside to get an extra tight fit. So in fact, this whole system is actually held up by three springy metal poles and it doesn't touch the walls at all. I had to modify the mounting loop to fit the diameter of pole I had and I also got some neoprene strips which add some extra grip on the otherwise slippery poles. We'll come back to talk more about this storage system but first I want to talk about 3D printers. You probably already noticed that 3D printing is pretty central to basically everything I make and to make this storage system I needed to do a lot of round the clock printing. I survived for a long time with two Prusa Minis, and then most of this year the only printer that I had was the Bamboo X1 Carbon, so I never had a particularly big output capacity. I have been ramping up considerably and so I knew I needed some workhorses. So I'm not being paid to say any of this other than my affiliate link, but I don't really think there is any better combination of cost, quality, speed and reliability than tidbit number four which is the Bamboo P1 series printers, P1S with an enclosure and P1P without. I went with the enclosures because my desk is very, very close. Otherwise, I think P1P would have been fine. To house them all, I went with Rapid 2 racking. It's just the best racking. Anything else I've used falls apart in my experience. Um, I'm not sure if they have it outside of Europe, but tidbit number five is that I strongly encourage you to get some properly sturdy racking if you have several printers wobbling around at once like I do, and not the cheap garbage that comes from Amazon. The test is that if you can put it together without a hammer, it's probably not sturdy enough. Now, if you are printing a lot, you want to minimise waste. You want to spend less on your filament, and you also want to minimise the downtime of running out of filament and having to replace the spools. You can use an AMS to automatically switch to another spool once the first one runs out, but a much cheaper solution is to use tidbit number six, three kilogram spools, which last three times longer than one kilogram spools, and generally you get a pretty substantial bulk discount too. You could put them on rollers, but I actually designed my own three kilogram spool holder, which fits on the back of a bamboo P1P, P1S, or X1, replacing the default filament holder at the back. It has a fixed length of PTFE tubing to curve the filament around from the spool to the printer, and it works really well. There might be some other designs out there, but I needed something compact and freestanding which would allow me to fit in two printers per shelf. This design is tidbit number seven. So I did all of this in parallel over about four months and in between other projects, so I was kind of figuring it all out as I went and, and tailoring the storage system to my working style, 
and with my five printers churning out multi-board parts on full blast, I started experimenting with their shelving system, which actually only released recently. If I had one criticism of multi-board, it's that it's not super well documented yet, which I'm sure is just because it's relatively new, but I was kind of making it up as I went along with some of these things, and so I came up with this system of making a really strong draw using right angle brackets, supporting a solid platform, which then holds the bin, and then I also designed my own special adapter, Tidbit 8, which holds the bin at the top as well. This seems like a lot, but I don't think that it's overkill, considering that in my application, the main panels are only held at the edges by the tension poles, so I think this extra rigidity does go a long way in not letting the whole thing sag. You even have the option to feed some wooden dowel through the brackets and make some little spool holders for your wires and solder, making me a compact little soldering station, which is a bonus tidbit number 9. That then gave me the additional idea to make a bit of a photography area. So I know that my channel is not really known for high quality audio or video or lighting, but I think that the founding of the COG Lab could be the start of a new era of better production quality for me. And so I bought some photography backdrop paper and used another piece of wooden dowel to make a tidbit number 10, a retractable area for some very nice shoots or finished projects and stuff like that. The beauty of the vertical storage system is that it doesn't really take up any extra space to have this relatively big thing fold away into almost nothing. I wanted all of my favourite tools to be super easily accessible because I hate having to search for something when I need it, and I know that I'll never put it away if it's several drawers deep. So I used Multiboard's vernier caliper holder, and I also found Liquorock 88's iFixit Manta tool holder, and I adapted it to make tidbit number 11. So by smushing it together with a multi-board bracket, I made a really nice and easy holder for my iFixit Manta set that I can use to get my screwdriver and allen bits using one hand only when my other hand is busy assembling something. So it was around this time of the project that I started appreciating the coolness of my little corner and so I got the urge to take it too far as if I was building a gaming PC and I started adding tidbit number 12 RGB LEDs. Now I'm not going to pretend they're not mostly for cool factor, but I will say that they give me a bit of much appreciated extra light when I'm soldering or assembling, and as someone who passionately hates overhead lighting, I can use it for some nice ambient lighting when I'm doing CAD or editing. Tidbit number 13 is the Pimeroni Plasma 2040, which I'm using to control these. Now I could go into a whole tangent about why my new fixation is the Raspberry Pi Pico chip, but I'm going to save that for a future video and just say that Pimeroni makes some really cool RP2040 boards, and they do so from Sheffield, which is actually really close to my hometown. So this was actually the first time that I'd used MicroPython and programmed a microcontroller through Thony, and it was actually so simple and easy that it made me feel stupid for not having looked into this earlier. I can be a bit resistant to change if I think there'll be a big learning curve, but there was not. Tidbit number 14 is this super quick and easy Python script I cobbled together to switch between modes using the onboard switches on the microcontroller. It's easy to add more modes, but to start with I made a rainbow mode, a warm white mode, and no points for guessing what my favourite colour is. Tidbit number 15 is the housing I made for the Plasma 2040 board. It holds it pretty securely and it leaves some space for cable management. And it made the front face thin enough that you can see the onboard LED shining through the text on the front. To make things easy, I wanted to use the onboard switches, but they're a little small and kind of too flat to the board to be able to press them down nicely. So my tidbit number 16 is this idea that I had for print in place captive switch extenders. They're basically sliders which allow you to press the switches from a distance and with a larger diameter button but I knew that would be really fiddly to put on the front face while holding all the pins in place and trying to get all four lined up without losing any. So I made it so that all four are printed captively inside the housing. They can't escape and can only move a few millimetres each way. And it's pretty easy to make a design like this using a small gap of around 0.2 millimetres all the way around and making sure that the shapes are steep overhangs of 45 degrees, meaning that it's easy to print without any supports. Tidbit number 17 is that I used OnShape's configurations feature to make separate versions of this design for both a freestanding housing and one designed to fit into the multiboard, and you get a handy drop down menu for which version you'd like to view. Now, I think that you guys already know by now that I am a big fan of OnShape. OnShape is the sponsor of this video, 
and their platform has completely transformed how I approach CAD design. I know that some people have mixed feelings about cloud-based programs, but honestly the fact that it is accessible from any browser window has been a game changer for me. Not only because I can access my projects on any PC, but I've actually started doing CAD on their iPad app, which honestly really surprised me with how powerful and intuitive it is. It's perfect for those moments of inspiration when I'm away from my main work session and I found it incredibly handy for making quick adjustments on the go. I can go out with just my little side bag and this is all I need to design robots. Pretty crazy. One of the things that truly sets Onshape apart is the collaboration tools. The ability to branch, merge and manage changes in real time just like version control for coding projects it makes even complex projects so much easier to handle. Plus, these features are exactly how I'm able to keep my patrons up to date with real time access to my CAD files. They can explore the latest versions of my projects as soon as I make updates. If you're curious to try it yourself, use the link below at onshape.pro forward slash Will Cogley to get a free hobbyist license. For professionals, you can use the same link to try the pro plan free for six months. So I went back to put the finishing touches on my nano print farm. Tidbit number 18 is that when you've got a lot of printers that all look the same, you will need some way to tell them apart. Numbers are all well and good, but since I now have two automated material systems for a total of eight different colours on my X1 Carbon, I went with some fruit icons which I sketched out, converted to SVG files and then extruded through on ship. I actually think the designs are kind of ugly to be honest, but they're slightly cooler than numbers, so there you go. Tidbit number 19 is if that you're sharing a flat with other people and then mostly work in the office while you're sat at home churning out 3D prints 24-7, might not be fair to split the electricity veil exactly 50-50. So I got this Tapo brand socket adapter which monitors the electricity I'm using and also lets me switch everything off remotely from an app on my phone. It turns out I'm using Using about 50 kilowatt hours per month on printing, which to me is around 15 pounds. ChatGPT tells me that's equivalent to running a refrigerator for around a month, which doesn't sound so bad, an electric heater for just over one day, which makes it sound pretty good actually, or a human being for 20 days, which I'm actually not sure if that sounds good or bad to be honest. So one tidbit I really wanted to make that I unfortunately didn't get time to finish is some kind of unified control panel I can use to control my lighting and maybe some other stuff on my PC or in the lab. Tidbit number 20 is this work in progress project. Using Easy EDA, I started to design a really simple control board which would allow me to provide input with a simple rotating switch, like the kind you have on a Prusa Mark III and a tiny little monitor I could use to build a menu system. I love using Easy EDA because of its seamless integration with JLC PCB stock data, including footprints and data sheets, so I was able to design this really quickly. Once my design was ready, I sent it off to JLC PCB for manufacturing, and as always, they delivered excellent quality boards with lightning fast turnaround. Now my ultimate goal was to integrate this control panel into a custom keyboard, Kind of a dream project of mine, ever since I saw the customised modular keyboard project by Zhihui Jun. For myself, I envisioned a keyboard that not only looks and feels good, but has a built-in control panel for managing all of my lighting and maybe a few custom things on my PC. JLC PCB even offers a CNC machining service now, which would allow me to create a rock-solid chassis for this keyboard. However, the scope of this project means that it would need to be a standalone video, and I'm not sure if there's enough interest. So as much as I don't like to do the standard YouTuber engagement farming trick of getting you guys to like and comment below and telling me that you want it, it actually really would help me to gauge interest to see if you guys are interested in seeing me tackle my own modular keyboard. A big thank you to JLC PCB for their support, not only for this project but for enabling so many of my prototypes and designs over the years. They provide an excellent service and their ever expanding capabilities like CNC machining and 3D printing open up so many possibilities for makers like me. Thank you JLC PCB. So in the final run up to Christmas, I wanted to make my last five days to be some really simple quality of life workshop improvements that anyone can implement to put the finishing touches on their work area. Tidbit number 21 is to squeeze the absolute last few millimetres of your workspace, you can buy 90 degree power leads for your equipment, which backs up against the wall to protect the cables and keep them tight and compact. See, I told you some of these would be a stretch. Tidbit number 22 is my teeny tiny little label printer. I'll link the one I'm using, but I'm sure they're all pretty similar. I've had the easiest time using this little thing to label up all of my storage with labels I can make in their app and I can't recommend it enough. Tidbit number 23 is that I let the multi-board spread from my walls into my drawers by designing some super simple spaces to let me organise my bins and have it possible to set them down on any other multi-board compatible surface. Eventually I want to have every single surface in my house coated with multi-board. It's actually been a really handy way to organise my fasteners and I'm still in the process of decanting all these little multi-packs I've accumulated over the years. 
It also works great for all my different servos and I'm working on my electronics and everything else I own. Tidbit number 24 is something I didn't do. I bought these desk mounted power sockets, confused as to why they were so expensive and it's because anything that's designed for offices has a huge markup because they know that big companies fitting out their offices can afford to pay stupid prices for pretty poor quality sockets. If I had to do this again, I would 100% get normal non desk mounted power supplies and 3D print a bracket to hold them. There's loads of designs out there for that kind of thing. Tidbit number 25 is the love and respect I have for all of my viewers and anyone who likes my projects, downloads them, modifies them or just looks at them. I know what a letdown. But I would like to extend a particularly big thank you to all of my amazing patrons who support me and make these videos possible. If you want to get access to the CAD files for every single Will Cogley project then consider chucking me a few quid on Patreon. Thanks again guys, I'll see you all in the next video.